The amount of data is just staggering. It's in the air right now, streaming around us. Every part of your life can be quantified at this point. Just about everything from medicine to sociology to AI as data, it's a revolution. We're not just coming up with new ways of collecting data, but we're coming up with new ways of thinking about data. I'm a climate scientist. I develop advanced and often cutting edge statistical methods to analyze complex data sets. I deal with disease epidemics, trying to forecast the spread of Ebola in West Africa. One of the things that I study is networks and the mathematics of, of social networks. I'm interested in both the mathematical foundations of data, but I'm also really interested in lots of applications, in particular medical data. In life sciences, there are so many things you can discover from those massive data. But how to analyze those data becomes a more pressing challenge. The exciting thing is really how math and statistics are all coming together to solve problems. In some sense, the explosion of data science is exactly what has motivated the creation of a data theory major. This major is a partnership with the math department and the statistics department to be the other side of the coin that complements the application of data science. We really wanted to distinguish ourselves as being focused on a foundation of theoretical techniques. We really want to understand the underpinnings of what makes these technologies work. We need statistics to think about uncertainty in data. We also need mathematics to solve some of those complicated optimization problems so that can help us have faster and smarter solutions. You're going to learn all of those sexy topics. You're going to learn about the machine learning models. You're going to learn about the data science models. The additional thing you're going to gain from the data theory is you will be able to answer the why questions. Do you want to be somebody that builds robots? Or do you want to be somebody that understands how robots work and why they work, and then go also on to build robots from the ground up? Students in this program can expect to study lots of math at an advanced level, computer programming, optimization of algorithms, lots of data analysis and data visualization. We've created several new courses that are almost unheard of to require in a data science type major. A mathematical modeling course methods of data theory. And a very important one is data ethics and how it fits in with society. We want to train scientists who can be the leaders in this field. The world of data and data-driven approaches is just growing so fast. If you just learn what's currently being used, you're already going to be behind. Whereas our major in data theory gives you the foundation to be able to learn to innovate, to adapt to future things, to be the future and be at that forefront. I want to welcome you today to our Data Theory in the World Seminar, preparing for future work event. So today's panel features leading data scientists who are going to share with us how data is uh, used and uh, that all the challenges and interesting aspects of data theory, data science in industry. My name is Miguel Garcia Garibay. I'm the Dean of the Division of Physical Sciences. And it is my pleasure to welcome all of you today uh, I know that this is going to be a very exciting and engaging uh, panel discussions. Now, I, I want to share with you that in my role of Dean of Physical Sciences, I have really the opportunity and the pleasure to interact with a very vibrant community, community that is uh, all of us in physical sciences, which in addition to the departments of mathematics and statistics, which are represented here today, includes the departments of atmospheric and oceanic sciences, earth planetary and space sciences, chemistry and biochemistry, uh, and physics and astronomy. We also have uh, the Institute of the Environment and Sustainability. And I, I bet as I begin to say those names, you, you begin to think about, wow, these disciplines are so data rich. Like think about astronomy, the amount of data that is collected in telescopes, right? Think about, you know, think about chemistry, right? The, the incredible amount of data that comes uh, you know, through, through the analysis of just about anything that, looks, uh, that we look at. So what you guys are doing is really helping really all of the sciences, not only the physical sciences, right, but the life sciences, the biomedical sciences, to move on to the next level of, uh, of uh, scientific development. 
Uh, in other words, you know, what data science is, is really one of the most exciting uh, developing areas of, uh, of scholarship and, and science. And I think, um, you know, for, for, for the Department of Statistics and Mathematics at UCLA to have taken the data theory, you know, initiative and bring talented students like yourself, I think that that is uh, really, really very special. Uh, <clears throat> As you well know, in, uh, all, really, uh, statistics at UCLA has been data science since the very beginning. So it is only natural that uh, so many exciting things have been happening in this department, even though it's a relatively young department in, in, in the UCLA college. As you know, data theory, the data theory major focuses on the fundamental concepts needed to model data and to make sense of data. It is it, 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 it this foundation that allows for the fullest and best applications of data science. Uh, graduates, you guys will come away prepared to be leaders in industry and in academia. Um, so, you know, as, as Dean of Physical Sciences, you know, I'm excited about many of the things that go on in the division, but honestly, I think what goes on in mathematics and statistics these days is, is some of the most exciting, you know, developments, because again, again, that has implications on, on everything that we do. In a scholarship like mine, I'm a, I'm, I'm a physical organic chemist, right? And I, and I use data science. I'm learning about how to use, uh, you know, machine learning into my own scholarship. So I'm, I'm very excited about everything that goes on here today. And so it is now my pleasure to invite our moderator for today's panel, Professor Mark Hancock, who will introduce our panelists and will lead the event today. So Mark. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome everyone here also and uh, as a brief review of the video you, you just saw, what is data theory? You start with data science, science of how to learn from data. Uh, most data science programs focus on tools and te techniques but data theory focuses on the mathematical and statistical foundations of data science. So that's your quick reprise of what the video said, and uh, so it's a very good place to, to uh, start. So the purpose of this event is to look at preparing for the future of work as data scientists and data theorists once you leave university. Now the event's been put together by the advisory board for the data theory program here at UCLA. So what we have here are data scientists who work in industry and have already made that tra tra transition. More importantly, they also advise and manage data scientists who come out of university. So they're ideal people to give you a sense of what you can do now to, pre to prepare yourself for the future of, of work. So without uh, further ado, uh, I will ask the speakers to uh, tell themselves, uh, tell us a little bit about themselves, to introduce them, them themselves before we get to the questions which have uh, been submitted by uh, people here and we'll answer those questions one, one by one. But let me uh, start with Nitesh. Thank you. Um, hi, good evening everyone. First of all, sorry for being late. A lot of LA traffic coming from Pasadena. Uh, but uh, my name is Nitesh Tingra. I'm you know, very excited to be here and to meet so many bright uh, future data scientists. Um, uh, by the way, I was telling my daughter, she's nine years old, that I'm going to UCLA and she was more excited than me because so we live in Pasadena near Caltech and for some reason when we have toured both the campuses, she loves UCLA way more than Caltech. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so a little bit of my, uh, about myself. So. Um, I work at Capital Group. Uh, it's an asset management company. We have our mutual funds and ETFs. 
I have been there, I lead the data science team and I've been there for six years now. And um, prior to that, uh, I worked for 10 years uh, in very, various data science roles um, uh, in consumer finance and risk management at Barclays, JP Morgan, HSBC, uh, where my job was to predict, like, predict the consumer behavior, whether somebody would uh, uh, default, like their credit risk default, or what would be their payment patterns, et cetera. So more on the consumer lending side. So first few years were on the consumer lending side, but on the risk management space, and now I'm on the asset management side. And um, uh, educational background, I did my undergrad and graduate degree, uh, master's in statistics in India, and then I came to the US to pursue my graduate degree in stats and finance. That's a little bit about myself. Okay. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Karthik Murugesan. Um, and I'm here, so excited to be here. I was super happy. And I'm coming from the other university town of Irvine. I, I, I live in UCI, and right next to UCI, I see bright students from UCI. Uh, and uh, I now work in another asset manager. Uh, we are PIMCO, leading fixed income asset manager. We manage, uh, or we deal with a lot of commodities and uh, other fixed income credits and other fixed income um, related stuff. Uh, quickly to introduce myself, uh, I come from the other side of data science, which is the data engineering and data architecture. Uh, I chose this field from the time I took my first data structures lesson. Actually, I was only good at data structures. I wasn't, I wasn't good at anything else. I was like doing my computer science course. I was like, uh, I wasn't good at algorithms. I wasn't good at anything else. Data structures was something which I just stuck to me. And it was 20 years ago. Uh, so, and from that day, I'm like always been with data. I've been trying to uh, roll the wave of all the exciting times with big data, with the Hadoop world, and then now with cloud, and then all of those things. I'm, I'm it's a super exciting field. I'm so happy that this is what I like, and this is what uh, I'm in, and this is kind of the leading edge for everything. And I help data scientists like Nitesh. In my, actually, I worked in, uh, with Nitesh uh, in Capital Group uh, a few years ago. Uh, and yeah, I, I work with people like Nitesh to get them the data and also to ensure that they can productionize and then actually apply the models to ensure that the models can run in real world uh, and start delivering value day-to-day uh, -day on a daily basis. So I'm from coming from the technology IT side of the house, uh, helping both preparing the data and ensuring that the awesome models and hypotheses that data scientists bring in are uh, uh, in, in the real world, runs, runs in the real world. Great. So let's now turn to the first submitted question. It's up, up there. How did you choose your career or choose the field you wanted to go into? I kind of answered that uh, in my introduction. So um, to me, data was when I was in my school, uh, data was the most interesting thing. So I, I just thought that I was good at it. It was very interesting. And uh, I just started, got into that uh, as a career. Um, and I wouldn't say that, of course, when I was in my kindergarten and my elementary school, I wanted to be a race car engine driver or, or, or things like that, right? But motorcycle, <laughs> <laughs> motorcycle ra uh, motorcyclist and things like that, right? But when I was really real world comes into it and I started looking at things and data structures and that's when I decided I want to be there. Yeah, I think on the same lines, um, um, I'll also go back to my middle school. So um, I was more interested in sports rather than studying. So if I had to, uh, because my parents would ask me to, I would my go-to subject was math, because I really like problem solving and you know the fact that you could get answers so quickly, the instant gratification part of it. So um, so then you know in, in middle school uh, in high school, um, I started liking permutation, combination, probability th like probability of events, etc. So um, but I had no idea about data science or predictive models at all in, in high school. So then I spoke with a college professor, a stat and math professor, and that was very helpful. So he asked me what are your interests, I said, you know, this is that, and then uh, he recommended I should pursue a, a degree in statistics, statistical modeling. And then as I started, you know, taking my undergrad courses, um, I realized that 
this field is applicable to any other area like political science, civil engineering, environmental engineering, you name it. These models can be applied anywhere. Everybody want, wants to predict something or there's some hypotheses that they, they want to test. So I really found this very powerful that I could predict the future. So that didn't work for my stock portfolio that well, but <laughs> other than that, mm -hmm. like on a day to day, I mean, I would say honestly that every day I've enjoyed being in this field uh, because you know you have the power, you can do something innovative with data. So that's kind of my motivation to be in this field. Great. Next question. What sort of experiences would you encourage us to have so that we can have flexibility in choosing or changing careers? Can go first on this. Um, so yeah, I think um, you know, the, the courses that I think everybody's taking here in your curriculum, they teach you theory and fundamentals. And those like you were talking could be applied anywhere to design data science solutions. So if, if you're interested in any area, be it say financial markets or uh, climate change or applying data science to sports, whatever, uh, one thing that helped me, sorry, thank you. Uh, one thing that helped me was that um, you could take course, you can sit in courses, like not maybe some in other departments. Um, maybe don't take credit, just sit in the courses so that you can learn about those areas. Right, and then um, the, from my personal example, how that benefited me during my uh, undergrad and graduate program was, I was in, in interested in financial services. So I took risk management courses uh, in the business school, um, fixed income, equity course, et cetera. So that, there were two benefits. First one was, uh, my first job was in risk management, which I did for 10 years. So that course has helped me uh, decide that. Second was, um, Sitting through those courses, um, I, I found out that all the, in the, all the financial in industry, the time series data is very important. So then next semester I came back and took advanced time series in my grad, in, in the grad school. So then that really helped me and I use those, you know, I use, use what I've learned till date in forecasting. And then you know, you can build upon those as you progress through your career. So that's why my recommendation would be try out different things so that you know, uh, even if the even in areas where you're not interested or slightly interested, try out those things. I think I would I would uh, echo Nitesh's thing, right? So one thing I we always do I always recommend everyone to do is try to get your fundamentals correct, right? This is your opportunity. You are in school. Try to get your fundamentals right. Uh, it doesn't change because, like Nitesh said, when I was growing up, there was no data science. Uh, or big data or data engineering, but I just knew that this is the fundamentals. Get the fundamentals right, and then all the new tools that comes up or all the new uh, fantasies are, 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 uh, 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 that comes up, it's very easy for you once you have the fundamentals right. So get your fundamentals right uh, on your chosen area, and then like Nitesh says, try to expand your comfort zone and then try to go related areas um, um, uh, and then learn a little bit more. Uh, I always recommend for all the new uh, uh, interns who join in, the first five to six years of your career, you have to move, right? You try two or three, and we always have to say that the T model, right? So there's a T model where you, you, you are uh, horizontally capable of certain areas, and then you choose one area at, at, at around like fourth or fifth year of your career, you would be able to say that, oh, this is what I wanted to do and then you start expert going deep into that expertise. So uh, two, two, two aspects of this, get your fundamentals strong, re really, and then as, as you get into your career, uh, try to expand your career a little bit more, try different things, and then choose one area where you wanted to specialize, and then specialize that. Next, next question. It seems a lot of data scientists spend most of their time making great visuals and business sense rather than needing a strong technical or theoretical foundation. Are we learning the wrong things in school? <laughs> um. <laughs> yes. Okay, so I'm not a data scientist, but let me comment on that, right? The visuals are super important. Trust me, <laughs> the visuals are super important. Um, 
Yes, people will find that your data is wrong six months down the line. If your visuals are not good, they are not even going to listen to you on day one. So uh, visuals are not something that you should take it easy. Uh, they used to, you use data to tell a story. So uh, you know what, the, I mean, don't make the story, just don't create a story and then say that fabricate something totally wrong. Uh, but once you find a pattern with your data, once you identify that data, or the pattern on the data, there is a lot of creativity that comes into place to figure out how exactly you represent so that your audience, you need to know your audience, you need to know, are you talking to someone who's another data scientist? Yeah, probably you need to explain uh, uh, all the algorithms you used and all the models you used, uh, et cetera. But if you're going to go into your C-suite and try to explain, I think there's a different skill set that you need, right? And visualization is super important. Uh, learning that is not a waste of your time. Uh, while that's not the only thing, that is important as well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would agree, like, I mean, if you have to explain anything to a non-technical person, visualization is important. But like, in, in addition to that, of course, the fundamentals are key in our field. So if you have strong fundamentals, so I'll give you an example. So when we interview candidates for, for roles at Capital Group and other places that I've worked, um, we typically would give a case study where they have to do data wrangling, uh, build models, interpret, uh, tell why, then why the model is predicting certain things versus not, um, and then diagnose what things might, what things are not working. So it's very easy to tell when somebody is not very strong, that somebody doesn't have very strong fundamentals, right? There are so many tools available. You can use AWS SageMaker. Uh, data robot, like there are so many things, uh, ML, uh, auto ML on data bricks, there's so many tools. So you can throw in data, you can get hundreds of models out of it, but if you cannot make sense of it, then people can easily get that, right? And then second thing is, um, if your fundamentals are strong, the models that you develop would be very robust and they will have a long shelf life. And which is very important because when you're working with C-suite folks and business stakeholders, if you if you keep on delivering consistently accurate good results, they will trust you. So that's how you're building relationships, building trust in the organization. That's very important for career progression as well. If I might just add a little to that, um, the, one of the ways I describe it is that it's very easy to learn all the words. Uh, it's much harder to know exactly what they mean. So I think in school we should focus on that, not just finding out what the words are, but understanding what they actually mean in terms of broader data science. And if I may add the one more, or the second word, the business sense, right? So data scientists in majority of the organization now belong to the business group, not to the technology group. So the expectation is you should know, as a data scientist, you should know what the business is. And then you cannot, your, your, there's a saying, right? Your, um, your eyes cannot see what your, your your mind doesn't know. So even if you, there's a obviously staring pattern. If we are in financial industry, and if you're going to, and we have uh, data, I mean, we work with data scientists who are always trying to identify alpha, essentially identifying uh, investment opportunities. If you don't know what you're looking for, how much ever uh, 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 strong you are in the technology, the underlying technology, whatever you know about it doesn't matter, right? So you need to know where the opportunity is and you, sh you should be able to find the patterns and you should be able to come up with hypotheses which you can test with your data scientists. So the business sense or the business aspect of it is also super important. And as I said, again, to reiterate, data scientists in majority of the industries are not part of the engineering technology group. They are part of the business arm of the organization. So yeah, the, both, the, both the aspects are quite important. Now, uh, along those lines, we want some uh, audience participation. The question is, what percentage of time do you think data scientists spend on data preparation and modeling? We're going to do this with a show of hands, and you must, there should be no non-response. Non you know exactly what I mean. <laughs> Uh, so let's go with 25%. Four options, 25%. Show of hands. 50%. Put them up high. Okay. 75%. Okay, and 
All right, I think we saw those numbers. I'll give you a quick summary. I'm going to say 40% gave 50% and then 6% gave 75%. Uh, would you like to comment on this? Sure. Um, so I can take that one first. So, um, yeah, I mean, the reason why we kind of pose this question is just to see, you know, what everybody thinks about how things work in the industry. Um, my, my answer would be between the, the middle two numbers here, 50 and 75. It depends on um, what kind of firm do you work at and how established their data science practice is. So I'll give you like two examples. So um, in my first 10 years when I was in the credit risk space, so this is credit card industry, for example, or consumer loans. So we all know about FICO scores. So FICO, it's a very established industry where you, you, you're predicting some, whether somebody will default or not, et cetera, right? So in that organization, it's assumed that any decision that's made on an application, a credit card application, for example, will be driven by a model. So there, in my role there, it was 75% data science, 25% talking to stakeholders. But still, um, uh, what Karthik was saying earlier, like business sense, right? I think it's very important. So I took one year off from the data science role and then I went to the credit strategy side, where I would actually take the models from the data science team and then build a credit strategy on top of that. So that helped me really gain the perspective, which when I came back to the team, it helped me identify areas where things did not work and how could we improve those models, because it was already kind of a very well-established space. But now in asset management, so Data science has been, was relatively new in asset management. So Sandeep, who's my boss, so he started uh, the team at Capital Group in 26, 2015, and then I joined in 2016. So data science was relatively new. And so there, I would say initially, I would spend 25% time on the models and 75% time talking to stakeholders, understanding what, what their perspective is and building trust. So an example would be if you were to recommend products to our clients, right? Say a fixed income equity versus a uh, fixed income versus equity versus other products. So we're building a recommender system. So there, first we started with something very simple that we could explain to our stakeholders so that they feel comfortable, right? So there it was 75% talking to them and 25% model. Then we, so it was a rules-based kind of system. Then we moved to uh, a collaborative filtering kind of system, and then to AI, completely AI-based. So then, as the Data science practice matured. Uh, that time, on, you know, I spend more time on models. So this, this kind of the point I want to make. It's, it's not, you know, it depends. And you might end up in a startup. You might end up in a very well established shop. So it really varies. So uh, there are three components, right? As a data scientist's life has three components. One is the data preparation, which is where I come in place, and almost 80, seventy-five to eighty percent of my time is like in data preparation work, um, and then the data modeling itself. And finally, the business, working with the business. So uh, there is a, I mean, you, there was a lot of research that, and a lot of uh, uh, press that covered and said that the data preparation and finding the data, you, people spend 80% finding the data or preparing the data before you can even feed it into the model. Um, that was true some time ago, but with n newer technologies that is coming into play and then a uh, lot of data providers are preparing the data ahead of time, so if you are going to use uh, more modern stack like uh, Databricks or Snowflake, there's you you are you are able to get the data prepared by a vendor. So you, even before you say you want weather data, before you have to go scrub the websites and then prepare the web, we, weather data, and then it's like it's it's eighty percent or ninety percent of your time to just to get the data into and then try to predict. Hey, how was wheat prices? Uh, when when the weather when when the weather touched this much or the rain was below a certain level, and then you want to predict on the wheat price and you wanted to buy futures on wheat, getting the weather data was 80% of the time. Now you have prepared data. Uh, there are providers who provide the data, prepared data out there. You just can go get that. Uh, uh, so still, I would say that 40 to 40 to 50% of your time uh, will be spent on preparing the data and ensuring that the data is of uh, uh, what trustable data, the data is trustworthy so that you can start testing your hypothesis, start, start building your models on. Uh, and then the real data science input or output and then trying to predicting it, it's like really still going to be like 20 to 30 percent of the time and 20 to 30 percent of the time is going to be again talking to business and trying to understand 
uh, is this really something that we can, uh, 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 is, is it reality, right? So sometimes uh, your data models could say uh, things like, I, I mean, there's a very, again, another very famous um, uh, prediction that was, people who buy diapers in Walmart also buy beer, right? So is it like, uh, what does it mean, right? Uh, I mean, I didn't understand it before. Now after I had my kid, I understood why. <laughs> but so yeah, there are some theories that comes up that may not make sense, right? That could just be coincidence. So the, you need the business context as well. So talk to the business, try to understand what, 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 it, what it really means. Uh, but data preparation is better now uh, than I, I, I've been in the industry for long. Uh, getting better and better, but still, it's kind of boring for some people. Uh, I make a living out of it, but uh, uh, it's boring for a lot of people. All right, next question. How can we as students practice applying the theory we learn in math courses to real life scenarios? I'm going to pass on this. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, many ways. So, I mean, I'll go back to what, what we were discussing earlier. If you're interested in some area, explore more, right? So, um, if you're, you know, say, interested in political science or something, just have a casual chat with the professor in that area. Say, hey, can we get access to some data? You know, more, more things you practice, more data, different types of data sets you work on from different industries, you will be more ready when you go like day one of your job. So try to you know talk to more people, network, get data from different areas, and then that's one thing. Second is try to that will help you. One model, one type, certain types of model might not work in one industry, but might work in the other industry. So this will also help you uh, get exposure to a broad breadth of models as well. So that's kind of you know, I mean that's. Something I wish I did more of when I was in grad school, but I, th I think we're going to talk about that a little bit later. But um, yeah, I mean that that will be my recommendation. Um, get your hands on as much data as you can from different domains. Um, and I know, like in grad school, there is time. I was in grad school. There is time. You can <laughs> you can try to uh, squeeze in that. Great. I'll just add to that also. Uh, from my perspective, uh, data tells us about the real world where math tells us about artificial worlds, but worlds that could be. And we learn a lot from worlds that could be about the real, real world we live in. So that's one way of making the connection between the two. How can new entry level applicants set themselves apart from the rest of the candidate pool? And related to that, what quality skill makes you say, I want this person to be on our data science team. So, in 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 any any field, right? So, uh, you need to differentiate yourself from the rest of the rest of the crowd. So, it's not about you having A's in everything, right? You can have C's and D's as long as you have in one particular field or one particular theory that you are really strong on. So having a project that you have already done and then demonstrating that you, I have done this and this is what it is. And if you are and in an industry where you are interested and hopefully that's the industry where you are interviewing, uh, that would be awesome. But r even outside, let's say that you had done an amazing um, uh, project on COVID and then you go to the interview and then say that, hey, this is what I did, this is the project I did on about the COVID thing, and I did some prediction. It could be wrong. It need not even be correct, right? So if you are passionate about it and explain that, I predicted this, but this was this did not happen because of these three things hypothesis that I did was wrong. I, that's going to definitely that's going to uh, differentiate you from the others. It's the, it's, it's a passion that you show, and then that, uh, that 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 you prove that you have applied something, you have tried something. And then you also learned whether it was successful or not, whether you learned from it, what you learned from it. And if you can talk about that, that would give an opportunity for the interviewer and the person who's reviewing your uh, resume to uh, connect with you and ask more questions. So uh, I would say that uh, take one area, specialize on that, and then try to get some actual working project 
put some effort to do that. Uh, I mean, I, and don't take my word on C and B, so that, that's not acceptable. I was just giving it. <laughs> I was just exaggerating on that. <laughs> oh, he was probably referring to my grades. <laughs> Uh, I was slightly better than that. Um, so I mean, I would agree. Like, I think uh, it's very important to have deep, deep understanding and knowledge of certain areas that you can demonstrate in in your interview. So, uh, being detail oriented, and uh, you know, in our field, I think everybody here is very smart, very detail oriented. So that's one. Second is, uh, like we were discussing earlier, uh, strong fundamentals. So have in depth knowledge of a couple of areas. Um, that will help you answer why something works and why something will not work. And again, I'm, I mentioned this earlier also, I'm emphasizing on this because in interview, these are the things that, are, that people focus on. Why did this thing break? Can you explain? And because that happens in the real world. So, so that, and then other thing is, again, I mentioned earlier, have, have like a couple of areas, but also get exposure to a couple of different types of models, right? That way, and the interviewer can see that, hey, you know, this person can tackle different problems, not just not just one. So, so that's another thing. And then, um, just show that you're very resourceful. And how that, that one way of doing that is, you're building a model, and the model should be efficient in terms of when it, when the model runs on real big data, it should be efficient. So, just try, you know, if you get a chance, try to focus a little bit on the engineering aspects as well, because you're not going to just give model to Carpix team and they're going to implement because you know the model inside out. So you, you need to make sure the model is efficient, right? And so just imagine day one, you go in and you're assigned a project, right? And you're able to do data wrangling well, you're able to fit models. And then there, there is a road bump that you're not able to deploy it properly because there are certain issues. Now, if people see that, hey, this person is so resourceful, and is able to wear different hats, and is able to get that out of the door. So that's, I think, a big thing. So just I would say, build a couple of areas, fundamentals, broad knowledge, and then also at the same time um, have uh, strong fundamentals, and then uh, uh, like a little bit on the like a little bit on the operational side, focus on operational side as well. The next question, what specific skills do we need to find a job in today's market? I think last week the answer would have been very different, right? So last week the answer is you have a data science degree, you're going to get a job. Uh, I think this week or next week it's going to be slightly different. I mean, I think it's pretty much what um, Nitesh said and I said in the previous uh, thing, right? Be strong in your fundamentals. Um, have a couple of Git, GitHub um, um, have a GitHub account, uh, have a couple of projects there, working projects there, and when you apply, just quote your project and this is what you did. Be passionate about one area, and uh, hopefully that is an area where uh, you can find a job in, right? So, and you apply on that area, so y you will get a job. If, if I find someone who says that I'm passionate about data, and I've been doing this for a certain number of years, uh, even if they are not in the technology stack that we are, right? we, for example, PIMCO is in uh, AWS uh, uh, stack, right? And somebody comes in and says that I'm on Azure stacks I did like for four years in college, I went so deep into it and I'm so passionate about data. Uh, I did this, this, this on a Azure area. Uh, I'll hire him in a blink of an eye than somebody who said that, oh, I have some AWS certification, but I'm not, I'm not that passionate about the data, right? So our, the, their passion doesn't come out uh, uh, on their resume or on the interview. Uh, I would rather hire the other person who's fundamentally strong, even though their their skill set doesn't align to my current uh, needs. So passion and fu uh, fundamental, that, those are the two things, and that you find, a, find a way to show that. Yeah, and I mean, maybe I'll add to that. In terms of, in terms of tools that we use, everything that's it's standard, R, Python, so that, you know, everybody uses those tools. Um, Again, I will emphasize on different types of models. So suppose um, you might want to focus on some Bayesian side or time series models, for example. I'm just giving some examples, right? So anything that you're interested in, that way you can, if a problem is given to you, you know, hey, like in this problem, I can fit A versus B versus C versus D. So they know that you have that really good understanding of the space, right? And that comes with practice. 
So again, like take real data sets. I think we had one of the questions earlier. Take real data sets and practice. And in, in the interview, it's very evident. Like if somebody has real hands-on experience, on take as messy data sets as you can, try to delete some information from there and see what you can do with that. Um, and then, you know, again, that will help you build robust models at the end of the day. Can you give advice on activities to help gain useful experience when starting out? Um, yeah, I mean, a any company I joined, so I, I think of it as like kind of joining a family, right? I mean, we have a really good culture here in, in our team. So, so when you're joining a family, you need to know your family members well. Right? So set up, don't, don't feel shy. Set up one-on-one -on -one with everybody in the team so that you know them. You, need, you understand what they're working on. That will give you a lot of business perspective, which is extremely important for a data scientist. And then um, in, in those conversations, they would also know what are your strengths, right? And you will share with them ideas. Hey, here we can use some queuing, queuing theory. Here we can use time series, you can X, Y, Z. So whenever they, they need somebody, they're working on certain problems, they will know, hey, I need to go to this person because of my, that conversation. Um, so that way you get to know people, you, you, you get to work on, re that's how you land like real good projects. And then um, at the same time, uh, that's how you build trust, right? And that you're kind of building your own brand there. So that's kind of like some suggestion that I also always give to like people who are starting out. So, uh, assuming that this question is saying when you say starting out, you're already set your, I mean, got, got a foothold in a, in a company and you're in the industry and then you're starting out, how do you get better? So, uh, I'll uh, recommend trying different things, right? So, uh, your, your main project is going to be you're a data scientist in something, but at the same time, try to work with your uh, data engineering counterparts and try to see what, what kind of engineering activities activities you can do. At the same time, you can also can try out like, hey, can I be the scrum master for, master for one of those uh, uh, projects? Or, so, so try out different things. I, I, I always encourage people to try different functions within the organization, whichever you are in. Um, so uh, early in your career, I mean, four or five years down the line, probably you may not, right? So you are going to be bogged down with so much of expectations on, on your shoulders. But beginning of the career, that's what I always say, right? you, the expectations are relatively less. So this is when uh, two things, you can learn a lot of things, you can say, I don't know. So there are two, two times in which you can say, I don't know, right? The first two, three years of your career and after 15 years of your career. So <laughs> once you become a vice president, that's what I start, like, hey, I don't know. That's, what, are the, what, are, what, are, what, are, what what do you have, right? So. Uh, so yeah, the first three years, you can always go and say, I don't know, can you teach me? Right, so, and after, after once you become a senior data scientist or a senior engineer, uh, the expectations is that you know, right? So that, that's, that's another way, I don't know, can you teach me? Do you think forming a union for data scientists would help or hinder the profession? <laughs> <laughs> Um, interesting one. I don't have an opinion on that, so I'll rely on data. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> that's my job. So yeah, maybe we can look at data from Starbucks. They were forming unions, other places. How did that work out? And then try to extract features from those industries to a certain industry, and then say, you know, extrapolate to see what might happen if you form, form a union. But I mean, I don't have any specific opinion. I'll just rely on data. So um, uh, I'm going to be uh, more uh, what open about it and then say that say say what I think, right? So um, I think data science scientists or engineers are expected to be uh, more um, creative and highly skilled and more of performance based, right? So two engineers or two data scientists with same experience. Uh, three years down the line, five years down the line, are not going to be in the same place. You are, you are able to uh, set your own destiny by your hard work, your intelligence. Um, having said that, I don't believe 
uh, union, you, I, I, while I support union for a lot of uh, other work areas, uh, when it comes to creative work area, uh, I think, um, I, don't th I don't believe it's gonna um, uh, uh, help that much, right? So it, I, I think it, it probably might hinder us. Uh, having said that, NBA players and NFL players have um, uh, unions. So if the union can be structured that way, maybe it works. Uh, but in a, in a, in a traditional uh, union sense, I would, I would say that uh, A, we, you don't need it. Data scientists and engineers don't need it. There's a lot of demand if you're good. Uh, even if you're average or above average, if you can get into UCLA data science program, you are above average. And then uh, you, you will have a good career, trust me. <laughs> What advice would you give to your college self? <laughs> you had to ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> Glad you didn't ask that in front of my wife. <laughs> um, well, it's a tricky one. Um, yeah, I would say I wish I was more open-minded when I was in graduate school. Um, you know, I was giving an example of I took courses in business school while I was doing my graduate study in statistics. So even there, um, I took classes in options, option theory, option pricing, fixed income, and risk management. And I was so fixated with options and risk management, I didn't pay enough attention to fixed income. Right? That was me being narrow-minded. I regret that so much because later on, on job, when you have to do something like that and you don't have time, you kick yourself like, why didn't you do that? So I had to spend so much time later on, you know, learning about those concepts because what you do in school stays with you forever. And then you build upon that as you progress in your career. So, you know, again, like uh, I would say, get exposure to as many things as you can when you have time. I think I, I would agree with that, right? So yeah, learn as much as you per can, and then get your fun, fun, again. Re I'm saying the same thing again. Get your fundamentals strong. I mean, the, it's not going to change. The tools can come and go. The fundamentals are not going to change. So focus on your fundamentals. Be it on math. Be, be it on computer science. Uh, focus on your fundamentals. Focus on the uh, 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 your, your algorithms and learning what the algorithms are, learning what the models are, learning what the uh, math fundamentals are. So I think that's, that's, that's what it is. Maybe, maybe one, one more thing I'll add is, I wish I had more hands-on experience. So I did like two projects, both were, um, one was in, in the space of transportation systems engineering, doing travel demand forecasting of different modes of transportation during my undergrad. And then one I did during my master's degree uh, which was predicting stock prices. Again, I'm really bad at that. So, <laughs> so there were, those are like two areas that I experiment, get, got my hands on and two different types of models. Like first was more on the logic, logic model kind of space and second was more time series. I wish I had done much more of that, 10 different, 20 different data sets and different areas that would have prepared me more for day one. All right, so that brings us to the end of the submitted questions. But the second phase now is where we take questions from the audience. We should have a microphone that will be passed around if you have any qu uh, questions to ask, ask it from. Uh, for those people online as well, uh, if you submit questions by the same form that uh, were submitted questions for the event, uh, I will look at my phone and read, and read them out. Don't be shy. As you see, they're very good at answering questions. <laughs> One question there. Uh, what's your favorite model? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, role model is Sebastian Vettel from Formula One, but <laughs> in terms of <laughs> in terms of uh, favorite model, I, I I think my favorite I mean area I, have, I think probably mentioned you could guess is time series, uh, given my interest in finance. But 
initially starting on it was arima arch garch models but then as you know more the space evolved now we are using lstm as a more neural net based models as well to do time series based prediction um, for flows of our funds mutual funds like you know it's very volatile times now you know we all know about inflation and fed raising rates xyz so many criteria uh, dollar being at, at the peak so so many things going on so in this this crazy environment we need models that are that can take in a lot more parameters than more i guess traditional models i would say so that's where we're using lstm models which are giving us very good results um, uh, in, in in this time so i just mentioned that i'm going to pass on that so I'm not a data scientist. <laughs> Question over there. Thank you. Just a quick one. There's a lot of, uh, when you talk about data science, there's a lot of discussion around whether it's not the restricted context. So I don't know if you have a chance to apply them to the NAS, each of those so sorry, so your question was uh, about uh, regularized models, lasso and ridge regression, those kind of things. Yeah, yeah, so when you, when you look at data science, there's a lot of discussions around those restricted models. I don't know if you have a chance of applying them in real life. Um, I would say not in the last five or six years, but yes, we, we have used, I mean, I've used lasso and ridge regression. Um, but again, like you have to compare, you, you need to know the plus and minuses of each model and then compare that with other models that are available. So that's why I mean, go back to fundamentals are very important and then this space. So, but yeah, I mean, I, I've used it a while ago, but not in the last four or five years. We are heavily relying on when we have to explain something, we are relying on more uh, classical ML and statistical models. When you have to explain something to our CEO, why did the flows go up or down in a certain fund? Is it this, is it SNP, is it WIX, is it performance of the fund, X, Y, Z? Then we use more simpler models. But when we have to be very precise in targeting something, then we use more complex models. So in that case, we might not use Lasso or Ridge, it will be more of a neural net based model. Maybe a philosophical question for you. Um, on the, on the general concept of modeling the system, what do you think about the possibility that a model can actually change the system being modeled? Wait, wait, it's a very deep question. <laughs> it's a model that can model a uh, system of models. Um, well, I mean, uh, I can kind of correlate that to maybe if you think about uh, reinforcement learning. Um, again, we are starting to use that in our industry, but uh, I think of it as, I mean, it's a framework, but it could be also interpreted as a model of models because you have different outcomes at each step, right? I mean, uh, your uh, agent is playing a game, you go from step A to step B, you run trials hundreds of times, thousands of times, and then you come up with the optimal path um, through that. But that, I think, could be done through some other frameworks as well. When you have a probability of each step, there could be a separate <laughs> model for each step, right? And then you're putting a model on top of that to optimize all of that. So, I mean, I mean, it's, it's like, um, th there are, you can create a framework. I mean, I won't be opposed to that. I think there are, other frameworks based on that concept, I believe. Um, and I think as this field evolves, there will be more and more, I guess, frameworks developed in that area. I don't know if that answered your question. Probably my answer was very vague. <laughs> yeah, I got asked this question. Um, has politics ever entered into the model building in your career? And you gotta be honest. <laughs> uh, regulators have, but not politics. So I would say in my credit card days, credit card space is heavily regulated industry. So mm, yeah, regulators would ask us to do things in a certain way and we had to because there was no choice, otherwise they would find the banks, right? So, but um, no, I don't think politics. I always go back to if somebody, if we have to convince somebody who's not 
familiar with data or this space, use real examples, re re use real data, and let's see if they get convinced. If not today, they will. I mean, I've seen that so many times. I mean, Sandeep, you can probably also, you know, uh, echo that from experiences in different places that keep on showing consistent data-driven insights to them, they will agree to that. So that should, I think, keep politics out of it. I have not been influenced so far. <laughs> Um, is there anything you don't like about data science and machine learning, especially like deep learning? A lot of times it's like a black box and you're just tuning the hyperparameters. And how do you overcome that in your work? That's a great, great question. We are working on that problem uh, these days. Um, I mean, so the, the thing is we have seen that these models produce really good accurate results, right? But then we need to, it should make sense also. Right. To Karthik's example, people who buy diapers also buy beer, so that would not fly in, in our industry. You know, that idea would be shot down right away. So um, what we do right now is we take the outcome of uh, LSTM kind of model, for example, like a time series model, and then on top of that, we'll build another simple model to explain all the Shapley values or something like that to explain what's driving those outcomes. Right, so we say we put, put an XGBoost model on top of the outcome, and then we explain why these are the three or four or five reasons why this prediction, why this outcome. And that is very, very important in our industry. So like a little bit context, um, we have Salesforce members who go and pitch our mutual funds to financial advisors, right? So there are about half a million financial advisors in the country. So what the model that we are building, we are recommending that, hey, in the next 90 days, can you, can you pitch these three products to this financial advisor? So we have to go to that detail, right? But the Salesforce members have their experience, they have experience 15, 20 years experience. Why would they listen to a data scientist? So that's why it's very, very important to tell them, hey, these are the four or five reasons. And then we test it with a couple of Salesforce members before we roll it out to all 100, 200 people. So that's how you know they trust when they see why. If you just gave them output of LSTM model, they would not use it. And we have seen that in the past. So. How did you or your team react just to uh, trumpet the value of data science or data architecture? Uh, a lot of times, yes. Um, and we all, we just say that we're experimenting. <laughs> so, no, but I mean, honestly, uh, uh, I mean, as a data scientist, we have to, I mean, it, it's okay to fail. That's what we tell our, like my team all the time. It's okay to fail as long as you learn so we have to experiment. So when we are recommending the next best product for a financial advisor, one model, there's no guarantee that that model will be the best one, right? It could be a simple rules-based recommendation. It could be, like I was saying earlier, collaborative filtering. It could be a knowledge graph-based model. There are going to be different things. We don't know which one will work until the experiment. We have, we have, you know, we have certain probabilities, but we don't know. So that's why I think it's okay to fail. Um, and as long as we learn and the things get better, if things get worse. That's not acceptable in, our, in, the, in the industry. And again, I think this is where the agile in the industry comes into play, right? So nobody goes and says that, oh, I'm going to go, uh, go into a cave and then build a, uh, with a team of 20, build something for two years and then come back out. So we keep uh, all the stakeholders in loop, and every week say, hey, this is the, this is what we're trying to do. This has certain amount of risk. But the but but the but the benefits are going to be or returns are going to be much higher. So do we want to try this? And then we'll also try something else, which is low risk, low gain. So uh, and also Nitesh mentioned it, right? So we roll it out to a very very small group of people, try it out in a in a in a in a in a, in a uh, try to reduce the cost, right? Fail early. So that's what we do. We failing is okay, but just try to fail early. Don't don't spend or invest too much resources before you fail. Uh, that's what it's all about. So, um, yeah, failing is totally acceptable right now. Uh, and I, as I was telling earlier, right, so even in your resume, it's okay. You did one project and it failed. It's okay. Uh, as long as you can demonstrate what you learned out of it and how you would do differently. 
it's fine. It's, it's actually accepted and even encouraged failing. And, and also probably I'll add one more comment that um, saying like that there are half a million financial advisors in the country, right? And we recommend products to those advisors. One, my, one model will not work for everybody, right? So one model might work for 10%, one could work for 50%. The data, the patterns might be very different. So it's, that's why we have to experiment so many different models. Uh, but at the same time, we need to know what those models do. So that's very important. When you present the results of experimenting with some particular model, how do you present those results to top management? In writing, orally, is there, or just both? Um, it, it, so it also depends, we have to guess their persona, what they will like, what they will like to hear. So some people, even in the senior management team are very technical. So to them, we would go into, tech, we would write a paper, like white paper or two pages or three pages explaining the methodology in detail. But there are some people who just want very high level information. So for them, it will be a PowerPoint going from objective, this is objective of this project, not going too much deep into the models, but this is what the outcome of the model would be. So focus more on outcome. And this is how this would impact your business. And, this is, and then we share the results when you run the experiments. These are the results. And these are the three whys or four top four reasons why this thing worked. So that's why maybe you should enforce this message across the company that these are the four things that, would, that worked really well based on this experiment. Thank you. We, this might be our last question. Uh, in your opinion, how much of a necessity versus just a complete waste of time do you see graduate school as being a um, requirement to entering your industry and also upward mobility within your industry? I know you have a graduate degree, so you seem like a good guy to ask. <laughs> I have two graduate degrees, so I, I hope that it was not a waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, I, I think it, it, it was very, very important, like I've mentioned throughout like this evening. You know, whatever I learned in school stayed with me, and I always have built on top of that. So there's no doubt I have 0% doubt that this yeah. was very, very beneficial. I think, I, 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 uh, okay, two, two aspects of it, right? So uh, I don't contradict Nitesh too much, uh, but this is one time. So there are two aspects of it. If you can, if you, the most important thing is for you to continue learning, right? You have to continuously learn. And you need to build that found fundamentals and foundation to learn. Uh, you can be a Kobe Bryant, get out of high school, and then become the top player in the league. Or you might need a little bit more time to go to your undergrad school or to, uh, to, your, to your grad school. Or you might need PhD, right? So it doesn't matter. There, are, there is no one path to success. Uh, but the key is learn your fundam fundamentals and then keep learning as you go, right? In, in any, any field, right? Be, I mean, I'm talking from the data engineering perspective of, uh, as well, right? So it's like in any field, just keep, keep learning as long as you keep uh, learning, as long as you have the fundamentals and foundation to keep learning, you're good. And even though taking exams is, was not fun for me, but now that I realize it was very, very important <laughs> because it tests, you know, what you've learned. So. <laughs> On, on that fine note, I think we'll have to uh, call it to an end. I'm sure there are more questions, but uh, we'll keep them for uh, another time. So let's give our two panelists a round of applause.